you bring God's word to us? Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to read um, this evening from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 6. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Charlotte, thank you. Let me introduce you to tonight's preacher. Ian needs lots of introduction. Uh, the, the oldest member of staff, well, longest serving member of the faculty, hence senior tutor at Cliff. Ian's bringing God's word to us this evening. I'm just going to pray for you as you bring God's word. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for Ian. We thank you for his ministry over the years here at Cliff in lots of different capacities. And tonight, as he is your servant bringing your word, may you inspire him and pour out your spirit upon him, that the words he speaks would be your word to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, really good to be with you. Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes. Really good to be uh, with you. And it's great to be standing behind a bulletproof screen. Um, <laughs> it's really always very... <laughs> what's all this? What's all this about? So here's the new book. Here's the new book. Uh, we've already had the cell. Let's start reading it. Let's quote from it. God is love... God is fire. The two are one. The Holy Spirit baptizes in fire. Spirit-filled souls are ablaze for God. They love with a love that glows. They believe with a faith that kindles. They serve with a devotion that consumes. They hate sin with fierceness that burns. They rejoice with a joy that radiates. Love is perfected in the fire of God. So says the Reverend Sam Chadwick, previous principal of this college, on page 40 of this new edition of the classic book, The Way to Pentecost. Do we need an American Episcopal bishop at a rather posh wedding to remind us of the power of love and fire? The answer is no, we don't, because our Sam, as we never actually call our previous principals, because I'm always very deferential to our principles, uh, was preaching and teaching and writing about this a mere 90 years ago. But the message, of course, still resonates, and we saw it only um, a week or so ago. God is love, God is fire, the two are one. And the bishop brought the house down, didn't he? Two things were mentioned on that wedding, the dress and the bishop's address. Bishop Curry's words about love and fire cut through, not because of his enthusiasm and because he waved his... I was worried about the candles. <laughs> but because of the truth of what he said. It's the truth of what he said about love and fire. But by the way, just to say to the bishop, we thought about our theme about a year ago. So, <laughs> Scripture is littered with pictures of fire, of living fire. Sometimes it's a sign of power. Sometimes it's a warning. Sometimes it's a comfort. Sometimes it's a sign pointing to something of truth. Think Moses and a burning bush. The sign, the symbol, the closeness. We thought about that theme just two years ago, if you were here with us at that time. And we thought about holy ground, and in fact I wore these very shoes. Exodus, the famous escape. The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Think of Elijah and the fire competition up on Mount Carmel. He's taking on the prophets of Baal and they spend all their days rushing around whipping themselves into a frenzy, trying to call on their God to burn the sacrifice. 
and Elijah comes to his sacrifice. He says, soak it if you want, absolutely drown it with water if you want, because my living God is going to come down as a consuming fire. And he prayed to the Lord, and fire came down from heaven and licked up the sacrifice, the fire of God. Think of the famous Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to buy down to King Nebuchadnezzar. They were thrown into a fiery furnace, but they survived due to the mystery fourth man that was found in the fire, and they were released unburnt. If you go to the New Testament, Peter gathers around a fire following Jesus' arrest. And he denies Jesus three times around a fire. But a few uh, days later, on a beach in Galilee, post his resurrection, Jesus has lit a fire. And he says, and he calls to his disciples who have been out fishing, I've got breakfast already. I've got the fish already. Here on this fire of coals, here's our breakfast. As the disciples tumble out of the boat in absolute amazement. And they gather again round a fire. And famously, of course, on Pentecost, as the disciples were gathered together, the Bible says they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Fire. Fire. And this weekend is a weekend we are going to reflect on fire, the blazing fire of God. For fire of God. (laughs) Not a physical fire. We'd hope to have a bonfire. And then health and safety said, if you have a bonfire, the marquees are going to go up, all the tents are going to go up, there'll be terrible things happen, so, so hence our mock fires everywhere. But we've come to gather around the promised fire of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. That's the bonfire we want to burn. That's the bonfire we want to burn. Bit of a shame that you arrived in the drizzle. Did anybody arrive in the damp in the morning? Yeah. Drizzle, dampish this afternoon. The last few days, stonkingly hot. Yeah? <laughs> the last few days, it started off cool and it's just gone up and up and up. And until the end, you're absolutely dripping. Because, of course, here in Britain, get to about 21 degrees and we can't take it anymore. <laughs> but I love the heat. I love the 30s and the 40s. That's the kind of heat I like. Go on, bring it on. Cook me. And I tend to go to the Middle East, and there the heat is dry, bone dry. So you can take the 30s and 40s. The hottest I've ever been is 51 degrees in the Jordan Valley. By the, you put your hand out into the sun, it felt like it was just burning and crisping off. Your head was pickled. Everything, every juice in you was just kind of losing itself. And I go to the Middle East quite regularly. And I was on a rooftop in Jerusalem a few years ago. And I was just cooling off. The kind of thing to do is you drink a lot of water, you put your little cap on, you wear nice linen-type things, and you sit on the edge. And, of course, I look across, and I thought, look at that chap. My word, he is huge. He was as huge that way as he was this way as he was that way. And he had big keks on, as we say in the north. Anybody use keks? Keks, big pants, huge pants. And he wore big, big boots. I mean, boots you could walk up Annapurna on, he's wearing. He's got a thick flannel shirt, check shirt. I'm thinking, does he know where he is? I mean, we're boiling here, it's about 35. What's he doing? He has huge leather braces to keep up his big keks. And he is sweating. No wonder he's sweating. I'm looking at him, sweating myself, just looking at him. He wore those wrapped round black uh, kind of glasses, the ones with the leather bits on the side. And on his head, oh, he wore a bright cravat. He was, you know, quite a, quite a thing to see. And he wore a pith helmet. You know the kind of 19th century missionaries? <laughs> He's there. You're thinking, how odd? You know, odd, really. And then he spied me. Now, I don't know what it is about me, but these people always see me and come straight towards me in a crowd. All right, you think, oh, no, don't, don't, no, don't. I'm having a quiet time reading my book over here. Maybe the Bible I'm reading. So he's coming towards me, of course. And then he stands in front of me. As he does, the sun is blocked out. I mean, it goes dark. (laughs) 
and in a thick Central European accent, which I will not replicate now, says, have you fire? <coughs> have I fire? I, I don't know. Have I, have I fire? Am I on fire? <laughs> I'm, I'm, patting, I'm patting myself. He lunges towards me again. Have you fire? Very insistent. Have you fire? And in a vaguely Yoda-like response, I say, fire, no, have, no, fire. Why, why do the British, when we're talking to some European, break up our own English? We can't even say, fire, no, have, no, have, fire, fire, no, no. what, hey? What? And then, then, he, then he got it out, of course. He gets the cigar out. Have you fire? Fire, no, have. I know. He looks at me, some British useless person, moves away. The sun comes out again, and he disappears off. But the question from my good friend that I remember at the time was, that's a good question, you know. Have you fire? Have you fire? Have you experienced the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you know yourself ablaze for Jesus? Have you fire? Have you fire? This is what this weekend explores, the question, have you fire? And our desire over this weekend, and it's the desire of any festival, of any celebration that you will remember the name, any anniversary, if you came to it when it was called anniversary, is this, that the blessing of God would fall upon you. That's a desire that you would commit your life afresh to the Lord Jesus Christ, or for the very first time, if you've never encountered Jesus in your life. That you would experience the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our desire. And if you know the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've committed your life to Christ, and you know the blessing of God, that this weekend would be a time when you would know the purposes of God in your life, and the direction of God, and the guidance of God. That's the heart of what festival is. That is our desire. And at the heart of this ablaze this year is the question, have you fire? Of course, you might be a bit like play it by ear so dramatically did earlier. Is this Holy Spirit fire even needed? Is it needed? In our reading, Paul travels to Ephesus and he finds some disciples and he asks them the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, no, we've not even heard that it's the Holy Spirit. We haven't even heard it. These Ephesians needed something more. They needed something more. They had repented. They had received something partial. They'd received uh, the, 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 the message that John had given them, the baptism of John. <coughs> Remember John? He was down in the Jordan Valley. He was calling people to repent. He was calling people to them. Hundreds of thousands of people were making their way down towards him. They were coming out of the city of Jerusalem, going down to the Jordan Valley, that very hot place I mentioned. And he was baptizing them as they, as they looked to repent of their sins. But this was the John who said, my, my repentance, my call is not enough. One who comes after me is mightier than me. And he said to his disciples, it was recorded in Luke chapter 3, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Repentance was good. It was a turning to God. Repentance was good. But these Ephesians had not yet fully believed in Jesus and received him into their lives. Acts 19 verse 4. John's baptism, says Paul to these Ephesians, was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, Jesus. They hadn't really received the fullness of Jesus, and they certainly hadn't received the fullness and the experience of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They had partial understanding, partial experience. But they'd not fully embraced the belief in Jesus and the promised experience that follows such belief in Jesus. The promise of God, the promise of God is the Holy Spirit. The promise of God is the fire of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit fire 
is needed, is needed to complete all that we are in Christ. An experience of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life is needed for you to know the fullness of what it is to be a Christian. It is needed. Broadbelt, another previous principle, opens up his book, The Burning Heart, with these words. The burning heart is surely the supreme need of the Christian church in these days of unparalleled difficulty yet wonderful opportunity. He writes this in the 1930s. And nothing really changes with that line, does it? Except perhaps maybe the difficulties for us as the Christian church are growing around us. The supreme need of the Christian church. We have a need of the Holy Spirit. We have a need of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit's fire is needed in our lives and in the life of our church. <coughs> Just look at us. I know many, many of you. We are good people, aren't we? We are good people. We are good people. Well, most of us are good people. So come on, try and be affirming. We're good people. Yeah. We attend our worship. Yeah. We give our money. We work hard. We attend far too many committees. Amen. I knew that would get the response. <laughs> We look to do good. We are do-gooders. Yeah? We're activists, especially in Methodism. We love them. We love being active. We open the food banks and support the food banks. We support debt relief, Christians Against Poverty. We place cafes on tough, poor estates and set up advice centres. We give clothing to the poor. We produce new innovations. We messy church here and we who let the dads out there. We do all we can. We believe in the words of Micah 6.8 to ask just, justly, love mercy and walk humbly with our God. We seek to free people from addiction and entrapment. All of these, all of these friends are good. All of these are good. But sometimes we ask, why am I so exhausted then doing good for God? Why does it all run out? Why am I drained? What is the point? We don't seem to be achieving what we should be achieving. Where's the breakthrough? Where is the power? And the Bible, of course, has the answer. In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, this is the, the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by merit, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And back to my friend, Chadwick. The church that is man-managed, instead of God-governed, is doomed to failure. A ministry that is college-trained, but not spirit-filled, works no miracles. The church that multiplies committees and neglects prayer may be fussy, Noisy and enterprising, but it labours in vain and spends its strength for naught. It is possible to excel in mechanics and fail in dynamic. There is a superabundance of machinery. What is wanting is power. To run an organisation needs no God. People can supply the energy, enterprise and enthusiasm for things human. The real work of a church depends upon the power of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. The real work of the church depends. We have a need. We have a need. All the training in the world, we have the best training in this country. But without the spirit-filled life, it does not. All the committees and all the gatherings that we put together and all the words that we use, and my word, the church can use words, without the power of the spirit. All the good works that we've just listed many of which I personally support and go, yes. But without the power of God, where are we? Where are we? Why are we feeling so tired and exhausted? Why? Because we're not living off the power of, the God, of God. We're not living in, 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 the, in the life of the Spirit. We're not on fire in that sense. We're not on fire. And as for making followers of Jesus... 
Why does our church life decline? Why seemingly less interest in the gospel message? Today, another quote. If the Christian church could be aflame with enthusiasm for the gospel of Christ, with the spirit of burning devotion to the person of Christ, and with an overwhelming passion for the multitude still outside Christ, we could change the world today. And when was today? 1966. And where was that? Berlin. And who said that? Billy Graham. Billy Graham, who preached here in 1954 to thousands of people on a field on this site. Why are we not as effective in our evangelism? Because we're not, it's not about technique. It's not like charisma of some preacher. It is about the power of the Spirit. Yes. Yes. A flame with enthusiasm, says Billy there. Burning devotion. Listen to the language. Listen to the language. It's a flame. It's a blaze. It's a heart strangely warmed for those Methodists amongst us. It's a life on fire for God. These are the themes. These are the themes. There is a need. Do you recognize the need? Do you recognize it? I don't want to live, Ian White doesn't want to live a partial experience like these Ephesians before Paul had gotten to them. A partial experience. Yes, I turn to God, but I need to know Christ. And I need to know more than Christ. I need to know the fullness of Christ in the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to be on fire. I don't want to miss out on the full experience of God's Holy Spirit in my life. I do not want to be the partial Christian. I need the power because I will not keep going week after week, month after month, year after year in my discipleship without the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And my brothers and sisters, I don't believe you do either. I don't believe it. I don't believe that you aren't saying, I need, I recognize the need. Here in this college, this is our inheritance. There's always been a focus on the work of the Holy Spirit in this place. Have you received the Holy Spirit is one of our cries, especially over this weekend, this bank holiday weekend, this Pentecost weekend, this Whitson weekend, as it's been called. And as you left the site in, in years past, there was a, another sign. There was a sign coming in. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Such was the certainty that you coming to this place and laying your lives before God would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, there are many, many different ways in, in Scripture to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. But time after time after time, it's fire. It's fire. So here, the story of Thomas Champness, kindled by a spark. The story of Thomas Cook, the second principle, on fire for God. The story of Sam Chadwick, how great a flame. Herbert Silverwood was one of our greatest evangelists on this site. Firebrand, he was known as the Yorkshire Firebrand. Broadbelt. Previous principle, 1930s. The burning heart is a secret about which many good people are, are in lamentable ignorance. It is an experience of grace which is only theirs who have been baptized by the Holy Spirit and with fire. Yes, it is a secret, but one intended for all who love, follow, and serve the Lord Jesus. The primitive disciples of Jesus had this secret. It is laying bare in the Acts of the Apostles and in the Epistles of Paul. The early Methodists had it too. It is writ large in their biographies. It is their explanation of their, listen to this if you're a Methodist, volcanic fervor, magnetic influence, and tremendous triumphs. <laughs> Cliff choruses. I'm not going to sing this one. Pentecostal fire is falling. Praise the Lord, it fell on me. Pentecostal fire is falling. Brother, sister, let it fall on you. We used to sing this to each other. Because I think we believe and we recognize the need. But I think more than that, there's an ache. There's an ache. I believe at our heart we ache for more of this. I think we have a desire for more. I believe we are leaning forward saying, 
We want more. We recognise there is a need, but we have an ache for it. I can tell you where I was on the 2nd of May, 1993. I was in the front room of my house, 5 Victoria Road, Dis Norfolk. I was feeling sick and I was pacing. I was pacing the room. And in my arms, I had my cat, Shakespeare. And, and Shakespeare was a bit baffled by this, but I carried her for a while. M Mrs. Shakespeare, I mean, it was like Anne Hathaway, basically, but I mean, it's Shakespeare. <laughs> and I can remember now the emotion of how I felt. I felt sick and I felt anxious. Aston Villa had spent most of the season challenging for the title. <laughs> they were on the top of the Premier League for most of the season. And with six games left to play, their manager, Ron Atkinson, who had previously been manager of Manchester United, my team, my team, I'm a Mancunian, other Manchester teams are available. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gordon. Did that well. And we had endured 26 long years without a title. We had been second to Liverpool... Nothing much said. Too many times. How are things going for you at the moment? Oh, well, actually, you're going to win tomorrow. And then on the 2nd of May, 1993, Villa were playing Oldham. Now, Oldham were on their way to relegation. They were going down. Villa just needed to keep playing, and they were going to win the first ever premiership. And it was all very gutted. We were going to come second again. 26 years of hurt. Villa just needed to keep going. And then, Oldham, miracle, Nick Hendry scored in the 29th minute for Oldham. Now, I have an affinity to Oldham. I was born in Boundary Park, not the, not the club, uh, the, the maternity hospital in Oldham, the infirmary. So I started pacing after the 29th minute with Shakespeare in my arm. Because if Oldham won and Villa lost, United, who were sat at home, doing that, would win the league. So the cat was a bit baffled, and I, uh, and I paced, and I was anxious, and I was aching, and I'd been waiting and waiting and waiting. 85th minute, 86th minute, 87th minute, 80, come on! 89th minute, I was screaming at Oldham, and this was the moment when United, 26 years of hurt, and then finally, 91st minute, 90, how long is this game going to go on? And then finally, the final whistle, and Oldham had won 1-0, Villa had lost, Manchester United had won the Premiership League, and Shakespeare was tossed to the ceiling, and Shakespeare came down going, what the, what's going on here? Like, this one, I'm not going to come round with you anymore. And didn't, 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 wasn't seen for about a week. But anyway, <laughs> football fans will know that ache. City did for a while, but not anymore. <laughs> Arsenal are at the moment. Liverpool, you don't have the league for a while. Um, but you will know what it is to, to have the long-awaited thing that you ache for. That you ache for. I believe we ache, much more importantly, even than my beloved football team, we ache for more. We ache for more of the Spirit. We lean forward. It's been too long, or maybe we have a vague memory of how it was in the past, but it seems to have been lost, and we say, do you remember, do you remember? We've been running on empty for a while, and we don't know what it is. The answer is this. It's the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. It is a life ablaze. Unlike those disciples in Acts 19, we have heard of the Spirit. But the question is, have you fire? Have we experienced the fire and power of the Spirit? We've heard of the stories of Spirit's activities in other people, but we, we want the story for ourselves. That's our ache, isn't it? There must be more than this. There must be more than this. We kind of ache towards a blaze. Have you fire? This is the Christian life. This is the promise to our need. This is the answer to our instinctive ache. We need the fire to fall. We need the full experience of God. We call out for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Yes? 
We have a world to win for Christ, injustices to confront, peace to bring, lives to heal, the hungry to feed, the refugee to home, the isolated to bring into family, love to offer and joy to share, and that comes with the work of the Holy Spirit when we are enveloped with fire. A blaze, a life on fire, says I am fully alive in Christ. A bit like the torch that arrives in the Olympics and the, and the flame that is lit at the Olympics, whether, it, whether it's London or Rio or Tokyo or wherever, it's, it arrives and it's lit. And from the moment of the lighting, the Olympics is alive. It's now, it's, it's happening. I want a life that's on fire, on fire, fully alive. The flame is the sign. The fire is the sign, the sign of a life lived fully for God, a life full of God, of the work of the Spirit. It blazed in their hymns. It crackled in their prayer meetings. It sparkled in their class meetings. It roared in their revivals. It glowed in their faces. Chadwick's description of Methodist people on fire. It doesn't matter a hoot whether you're a Methodist, Anglican, Baptist, wherever. It's the same thing. We need the fire of God. We need the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So back to our text. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Partial, but now fully, they believed. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. A new experience, a richer experience, a bigger experience, a life that was now full of the Spirit and on fire. So what of us this evening? What of you tonight? This weekend is all about the opportunity to ask that question, have you fire? And then to respond to God. So tonight I'm going to make an invitation but I'm going to make an invitation that invites you to consider opening yourself up to the possibilities of this fire over the weekend. Saying to God, look, I'm here, I'm seeking, I'm needing, I'm aching, I'm wanting, I'm desiring. So I'm going to invite you in a few minutes, I'll invite the band to come up now, because we're going to have the time to be able to have a, a couple of songs of worship as we come to a close tonight. But I'm going to ask you to consider, is, is that your, do you recognize the need? Do you have the ache? Do you have the desire? Are you leaning forward? Are you saying, this is what my Christian life needs? It needs the power of the Spirit. I need again to, to bring that trinity in <laughs> rather than living off the two living off the three, living off the three. <laughs>